Hi, this is John Vergara with Lord of the Strings and Heritage Soundcraft Institute. Uh, this video today is about how a luthier, such as myself, restrings an ode. Uh, Maybe different from a player, and even restringing could be different from luthier to luthier. This is just how I do it. And um, the example that we're going to be doing today is none other than a very famous oud. Maybe you recognize it. Maybe you recognize it from the ball. Maybe you even recognize it more from the face. But this is uh, the oud that belongs to Simon Shaheen. Um, we had found some damage to it. And we decided that uh, it needed some repair work, which I took on. One of the things, unfortunately, we had to do was replace the peg box because the original peg box was cracked. And I do have it here, and it may be tough for the camera to pick it up, but it was cracked along these three pegs. So um, Simone actually wouldn't be able to tune this oud uh, due to this, this problem. This is a very difficult repair. In fact, the really only way to do this repair is to make a new peg box. Um, of course, I actually uh, wanted to keep it original, so the dimensions I reused even kept the bone cap, as you can see. Okay, that style and the width of it and the shape. There was only one alteration done to this, and that is Simone and Nishib Shaheen told me they wanted one less peg because the original actually had 12 pegs. So Simone doesn't use that 12th peg the way he tunes um, using a single C here, they don't need the 12th, and he doesn't want the extra length. So I actually made it 11 pegs as per their request, so it just has 11 holes and 11 pegs. I clamp the oud between my knees like this, and it's actually, I have quite a good grip. Um, you would have a hard time actually taking the oud from me like this, so it's pretty sturdy in this position. Okay, so the first thing I do is I actually will pull the peg out, okay, out of tension, and then simply just pull the string. And you see it just comes off in a second. So I do that to all of them. Pull it out. That's simple. This one is over here. There are actually multiple ways that strings can be routed. The system that Simone and Najib Shaheen use and the one that I use that I adopted from them is very neat in terms of the winding and where the strings go, the routing. So in this case, the first string is here, second, third, fourth, the F, the fifth course is here, and then the last one is here. It can be done other ways. It could be the, the fifth is here and then the single is here, but it's the same idea. And, and, and in general, the strings will be pretty straight and neat, as you can see inside the peg box. We don't want string crossing. That's not good or helpful to when we're tuning. So. These are this is actually a new set of strings I put. Um, it's okay, I'll use them elsewhere. Basically, I did the uh, restoration on this, and I needed strings to put on to show you how to remove them. This has a small knot, and I'll show you how I put that in. That's if uh, the, the pegs pop, it, the string doesn't come loose. Okay, so then we have this end, which I work also in my lap like this. And you can start from these strings. I just push this through. This comes out. And you can pull that out. So I push this through, take these two ends, and pull it. Careful when you're over here that you're going, you don't push through the rosette and um, have any sudden movements. Okay. This is a beautiful bone rosette. It's carved. We don't want to damage that one. So I do the same for all of them. They have all the old ones here. Uh, a lot of people are going to ask me, what strings uh, does Simone use? Which altar? Um, Simon himself is not settled, nor is one set of strings good for every instrument. Some instruments have darker sounds, so you want to get a brand that can 
balance them and vice versa. I will tell you this, the one thing that seems constant is that he does use the Aquila, which are these, the white Aquila, okay, uh, for the G and C strings. I don't even think they make them anymore. I have a little bit of a stockpile. Obviously, so does Simone, but he seems to like them a lot and they work well on this instrument. They do not always work. Some of my instruments, some instruments I put them on and it kills it. So just because Simone uses it doesn't mean it's going to work for you. As far as which wound strings, that's, that seems to be what he's up in the fence about. Um, sometimes he'll spend a week restringing and restringing different strings until he's satisfied with the sound. So I can't recommend what he uses for the, for the wound bass strings because it changes. But I do know it seems that constantly he's, he's frequently using the G and the C from Aquila, the white. Um, take a moment now to tape this area off and you'll see why later. This is a low tack, this is a low tack masking tape. I don't want to put a very tacky masking tape on the soundboard because it may take some of the grain with it. So I just cover this area, I'm not going to push down hard, it's just going to be lightly on there. That's for when we do the cleaning. Now I actually already cleaned this fingerboard but we're going to clean it again to show you how I do the cleaning. This, I'm going to cover this area like so. Okay. Okay. I am now actually going to put this in a vise, but you can do it on a table. Put a little light on here. So the fingerboard gets a lot of gunk over, over the years, over even over the months. Um, I recommend people having a towel that they can wipe the fingers before they play and then wipe the strings after they play. Otherwise, there's a large buildup. Um, Simone is very clean. Actually, he takes care of his oud. So when I cleaned it, it wasn't bad. But this is how I do it. I'm going to take a paper towel. I'm going to wet it with using mineral spirits. Mineral spirits, it doesn't, I don't have a label on this, but this is mineral spirits. It's a solvent, okay, and it's good at getting grime off and sticky things. It's good at removing like uh, adhesives from masking tape, and it doesn't damage any finish. However, you don't want to get it all over the soundboard, which is a bare, bare wood usually, and you don't want a lot. You just want enough to do some cleaning. So I just spritz some there on a paper towel, and I'm going to get the area wet on the fingerboard, okay? Now I get steel wool, this is 4-0 steel wool. And I'm gonna hit the fingerboard with that. This is gonna really do the cleaning. Now again, I already pre previously cleaned this, so nothing really much is gonna come off. And the purpose of this tape is so that any um, debris and the, uh, the solvent, the mineral spirits, won't spill onto the soundboard and get this area dirty. So that's all that's there for. All right, so you're going to do this as much as you need it. The area usually that you need it the most is like where you play the F, the Fa, Mi, Nos, Bemol, the E half flat, um, the C here on the A string. Those are the most commonly played areas and where most of the grime and the gunk kind of cakes and piles up on. All right, so I'm done with this. I'm going to wipe it one more time with the wet. Okay, look at that even cleaned it and still stuff comes off. Some of it's also ebony, okay? Some of it's even from, from the steel wool itself. Okay, still had a little bit more come off. Now I'm gonna dry it. So I'm gonna take this dry paper towel, I fold it in quarters, okay? You don't really need a full one for this. Just kind of dry it a little bit. It's a solvent, so it will dry. Now this is a minor part of setup. Um, make sure you just wipe this, by the way, the edges a little bit, because it kind of drips over. Now this is a nice thing you can do, it's very simple. You take pencils, graphite, and you fill this groove with graphite, and the strings will glide nicely through these grooves better. This is basically a lubricant for the strings. The ones that would benefit mostly from this would be the wound 
strings uh, three to six. Okay, that's it. So that'll go a long way. And then I'm going to carefully remove this. Okay, let's give this one last drying. And this will dry pretty quickly. But I'm actually not done yet. There's one step I forgot that I would like to share with you. You could leave it here like this and then restring it, but I'm going to add some mineral oil. So I use mineral spirits and I'm going to grab some mineral oil, a little bit. I keep it in here. You can buy it. Most pharmacies will have it. And I'll put some on the rag here and I'm just going to apply it. So it's going to darken the ebony and it's, or the, or the rosewood or whatever your, the wood is of your fingerboard and it's going to, it's going to um, keep it moist and prevent it from cracking and getting dry. Okay, so that's, that's it. We have a nice clean fingerboard. I didn't uh, talk about addressing any grooves or anything. This fingerboard is fairly flat. Um, it was leveled probably recently by Najib Shaheen, so we're not going to have to do that. This video is mostly about restringing and then cleaning. Okay, so that's not that's good. You can see it has a nice look to it. It's healthy. It's shiny. And the wood will absorb that oil a little bit more. Do not get that oil on the soundboard. Okay? Don't do that. That's a problem if that happens. Um, if that happens, you might need a different solvent like naphtha to clean it up which is lighter fluid. So I don't really recommend people going that route. All right, and lastly, I will remove the last piece of tape very carefully. I don't want to pull grain of wood with it, chunks of wood. Okay, I used a low tack uh, tape, so it's not going to be too strong. And that's it. I keep that area clean and uh, we lubricate it and clean the whole fingerboard. So now we will move on to the next step of installing the strings. All right, so now it's time to install the strings. So here I'm going to take my first string. I start with the first string always. So this is the Do or the, the C. Now I know the knot is something that confuses a lot of beginners, even other people. There are a few ways to do the knot. This is how I do it. There are probably as many ways to do it as there are luthiers, but uh, some people seem to do it like me. So I start from, I insert it from this side first. Then I need enough length to do for the C string, the first string, I do like four loops. So it's going to come under. This is going to go inside. That's one. Then just bring it around. Two, one more, three, and one last one. Sorry, four. So it's four for the high C string because it's a thin string. And then I pull from both ends firmly. And that's my knot. I don't want the knot portion to be on top of the tie block. I want it behind. And later on, of course, I'll cut this extra length after I tune a little bit. You don't want to cut these right away because if it's short and you tune, it, the, it starts to get shorter and then it'll slip right through. So Resist the temptation to cut this right away. Wait until you tune it a few times till, till the strings stabilize and then the plastic stretches, or in case you're using gut, till the gut stretches, and, um, and then cut it in the end after a few tunings. So here we go. So this is where I continue. I bring it to where it's going to go, and I put the, the oud back between my knees in that position that I used earlier to remove strings. Now this is going to go to this peg right here. I can't use all of this string, okay? If I use this full length for this peg, it will cover the whole inside of this shaft right here. So we have to cut it, and you have to know, you have to anticipate how much length you actually need. So here's a rule of thumb that I use. So to where it's gonna go, I add a few inches. So this is one, two, three inches. Right here, if I cut it, this is enough length. Okay, right here. I don't need this. Okay, basura. Afuera. 
So we're going to, I'm going to use this. This peg actually has multiple holes, but I'm going to use the one in the middle, okay? Feed it through. Now on the first two strings, I like to do a little simple knot. So I will bring this like this. You don't have to do this, but I do it. And we'll, uh, right there, I have that simple knot that if the peg pops out later, um, I won't have to try to feed it through all the other strings that are there already. So I hold the tension, I keep the tension on the string, and I can control where I route this. So I just, I went over this, so I'm kind of securing it. I'm going to continue, okay, and I'm going to place it into the groove for the nut. And I can still shimmy it over and control the winding a little bit. So I put some tension. And then you can also, if you, if you, you can pull the peg this way and wind it more and then push it. So I'm going to continue on to the next string. So this has enough tension for now. Same idea as the first, of course, this is going to repeat. They will change as they go, but we'll repeat this just for the sake of learning. So I feed it through this direction. I don't know, this is probably another three inches here from here to here that I use. Go around this way, I'll do it slowly. I feed it through underneath into the loop. That's one. Okay, another one, that's two. Another one, three. And the last one, four. One more. And look what I have, you see that? And when I pull it, this knot is going to end up in the back. I need to give it a little bit more of a pull. Okay. Now I'm going to keep the tension on, bring it to the groove that it's going to be. Same thing. So it's going to this peg. How many, how many inches do we need roughly? Three inches. So what is three inches in millimeter and centimeter? Let's see. So if this is three inches, you're talking about seven and a half centimeters, roughly. If you're using metric, which I do use metric for many things, but for this I just say inches. So one, two, three inches. Okay, right about here. I use, please don't use your toenail clippers, guys. Okay, it's not a good look. These are simple wire cutters. You can get them at the Home Depot. You can get them at your local hardware store, no matter where you are in the world. This is what you want to use. If you do use your toenail clippers, when you use them on the wound strings, it's, they're going to get damaged and when you clip your toenails, it's going to leave like weird indentations. You're going to have scratchy toenails. So I have to point that out. All right, so I'm going to feed this through. Pull it. I'm going to add that knot that I told you about. One simple knot like this. Feed it through. Very simple knot. That's it. Okay, with not a lot of length in the end. What is that? A quarter of an inch plus? Okay, I, I keep the tension on the string now. Okay, and the oud is cradled in my lap. So look, oh, that one slipped out. I put too much tension on. Okay, let's do it again. Feed this through. Loop, and then pull it. Okay, but I keep the tension on, and while the tension's on, I actually turn the peg. So I can control this. I don't do it like this. This is what happens if you do it like this, look. Look at how messy that is. Look, I'm not holding this with my left hand, I'm not controlling it. And this is what you end up with. And rule of thumb, guys, keep the strings away from the walls. So look where it ended because I wasn't holding it. I can't push the peg in all the way. So the peg is just gonna slip. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna roll this back, start from, start again. So I have tension on here because I want to control where it's gonna go. So let's see, I'm gonna do one here and then I'm gonna overlap it right there. Now I'm gonna wind it. And now I'm gonna, as it gets closer, put it in the groove, and you can still control it. You can even control it by pulling it here and winding it. Okay, so for now, those two are on. We're gonna move to the second string. It's gonna vary a little bit as we go. Okay, same thing, feed it through here. Going back. Okay. So I'm going to take the back portion, feed it through the back toward the front. Now I have a loop. This will go through the loop. 
this out of the way. One, two, three is good enough for the G string because it's quite thick. So three loops for the G. And you see it's still, the knot is in the back. If I did two, the knot might end up on top of the tie block. As long as it's behind it, I'm happy. So we're gonna keep the tension on the string, put it in the groove where it's gonna go. I still keep tension on here. Put, cradle this between my knees. In this case, we're gonna route it to these two pegs. This is the way Simone does it. I think it's the best way, in my opinion, rather than the old school traditional way of putting them here because you're gonna end up a lot of string crossing and it'll be a mess. Call it a rat's nest. So it's going to this peg. We need about three inches. One, two, three. Right about here, roughly. I'm going to do that knot again for this string, for these last two strings only. So feed it forward, simple knot, hold the end and pull it. Okay, I'm going to hold, I'm going to keep the tension on, I'm going to wind it, place it into the groove. Now these strings, this is Aquila for the G and C, very um, rubbery texture to them, soft. So goodness, these take a long time to tune. They really take a while to stretch and to stabilize. All right, moving on, we're gonna move to the last uh, G string, sole. Okay, same thing, feed it toward the back. Loop it from the back around to the front. We're gonna give it three. One, two, three. Three inches roughly from where it's going to go. It's going to go to this peg. One, two, three. I'm going to do a simple loop. After this, no more. Simple knot. Pull that. Keep the tension on. Turn this. I can control where I'm going to wind it. All right, and then we're gonna move on to the wound strings. Um, this is a little different now. I'm not gonna do a knot in the end. The D is the thinner of all of the wound strings. Same row applies, a few inches here. Uh, how many do I do on, how many loops? Um, it's either gonna be three or four. I think three is sufficient. So around the same, it's going to go onto the back, into the front, into the hole. One, two, three, and pull. Yeah, as long as the knot's on the back, it's good. Tension. This is going to go to this peg here. I need three inches. It's roughly going to be about right here. I just quickly judge it. Now we're going to, I'm not going to get any special knot for this. We're just going to do straight. I keep the tension on while I turn the peg and it allows me to choose where I want to route it. Now I'm going to put this over here like this and that will grab that end and it's not going to slip. Okay, and just wind until it goes into its groove. Okay, that one's done. We'll move on to the next one. All right, route it through the back, to the front. One, two, three. Pull. See, they look consistent. The knot's in the back. Keep tension. It's going to go to this peg, so a few inches, or seven and a half centimeters, if you will. I keep the tension on, as always. I route it. To where I want it to go, I'm gonna cross over here now. Every situation is different, but that's how I'm doing this one. So far, as you can see, we're fairly straight on most of the strings, and it will remain that way throughout. Now we're gonna to move to our fourth string, the La or the A. Now, I probably will do two loops on the tie block. Two loops for the A, I believe. Let's see. One, 
two. And it is in the back, so that's enough. As the strings get thicker, you don't need as many loops. Okay, this is gonna go here. I'm gonna add three. One, two, three inches length. Cut that. Same idea here. Put a little string tension on. So same, same idea. One, two. Take this, keep it toward the back. When you pull, the knot will terminate in the back. Bring it to the groove it's gonna go into. Keep tension, I cradle it. And it's gonna go here, so it's gonna be one, two, three. Cut it there. I always keep tension on this. I don't let go until the end. Across here. Okay, I'm gonna do the fa, the F. This one will probably get two as well, just like the A. They're almost the same thickness. So one underneath, two, keep this toward the back on your right hand, pull. This is gonna go to this peg here. So I need one, two, three, actually, you're almost gonna use the full length of that. It's about to cut very little. Feed it through. Okay, it's happy right there. Okay, around through the back, into the front, into the loop, one, two. Keep this toward the back, pull both sides. The knot will be here, in the back. I don't want it on top. And into the groove. It's gonna go to this peg right here, so I need about roughly that much length, from there to there. I'm gonna wind it to the right few revolutions and then it's going to go over to the left here. Oops. Whoops. Let's try it again. Okay. One, two, three windings for this one. Then I'm going to cross over. Okay. Nice. So far, they're all pretty straight. Last one, slightly different. The last one, because it's a single and because it's quite thick. Sometimes I do one loop on the tie block, sometimes I do two. Let's see what we're gonna do here. I'm gonna try one. Um, this bridge has only one hole, sometimes they'll have two. You get to decide if you wanna use the outer or the inner. This one I have the only one. So we're gonna go here, let's see, just the one. Okay, now I'm gonna have to manipulate this. If I pull this, I don't want, I don't want that. So I can actually loosen it, I can guide it toward the back and down, and then pull it, and you see it's back there. Now I can also pinch this, and as long as I keep putting the pressure, see, I can actually control it and make it smaller, instead of it being wide and open. And when you tune it, it's actually going to fix itself as well. So that was just one loop I did there. But you could do two, but it ends up being a little thick. See, and you can, you can pinch this. All right, it's gonna go to the only groove it has on the nut. This nut was custom made for Simone by Najib Shaheen, and he just wanted the one slot for that, in spite of the original 12 peg peg box. This you want shorter because it's so thick, it'll eat up space inside here. So I say one inch, two, I mean two and a half. That's more than enough string for the last single drone low C, or sometimes two and D, right? So I'm gonna do, two over here and then cross over to the left. This is the way I do it. Some people, I know Simone sometimes will put it against here so it doesn't pop out. Um, you can do that, but I'm just gonna do it this way. Oh, just slipped out of the groove. Okay, I mean, you know, I'm not happy with it, so I'm gonna unwind it. I'm going to do 
one here, that's actually two, and then switch over. Just for balance and for the sake of string crossing. So let's keep it straighter. Okay, so now I'm gonna get involved in the process of tuning, and then I'll show you the last step. Okay, so I use one of these tuners. Um, I don't have perfect pitch, I'm not blessed with that. So I'm gonna get the C in. It's actually C sharp, Do Diaz. Now these strings are very rubbery, the texture of these Aquila, so lots of tuning over the course of a week or two. This is not a video on teaching you how to tune per se. Um, I do teach lessons and if you're a beginner student, total beginner, I do teach you tuning. Well, I guess I'll get into it. If you're tuning the top pegs, you really should have it rested on your knee like this, which I wasn't doing there. So, see I have the support of my knee when I push down. The bottom pegs are trickier, so if I were to do this one, I was actually high as F sharp. See, I have these two fingers here and one finger here. I'm pushing in and turning the peg at the same time. I'm pinching the peg box, grabbing it. So keep that peg seated inward. Now I'm, gonna, now I'm manipulating the top. I use my knee. I have a lot of support. Also, it's good, it doesn't put much pressure on that peg box. It's a bit of a vulnerable joint on most dudes, so you'll be saving yourself there. Lastly, we have this one. It's tuned to D. I'm gonna leave it D because actually I want the string to stretch, and sometimes we tune that D anyway. I'm gonna have to go over all of these many times, but I go quite aggressively. I might even go higher than the C, and make them match, just to help stretch them out. Here's a nice trick for those people who do not like the sound of new strings. I know Simon does not. Uh, Najib Shaheen will take the strings before he installs them, put them on a table, and hit them with steel wool. And what that does is, it kind of tarnishes the outer coating of the winding, uh, nickel or whatever is used in a particular brand, and take out that luster that's a bit annoying and buzzy, particularly like on the D and A string. Um, some oud strings can be very annoying and buzzy, so Najib figured out a clever way to, to round that off and give you a rounder sound. Uh, Simone much prefers older strings, within reason, um, but, and most people do. I don't like the sound of new buzzy strings, they're quite annoying, and you have to play on them for a long time to actually get rid of that, uh, that obnoxious uh, brightness and the overtones and the buzzings. That's that great Simone sound coming back to life. And we actually, I, f I picked up the oud and I noticed the crack on the peg box and this area was cracked here. And I, I showed Najib Shahin, I said, look at this. He didn't know. Simone has been using some other ouds. He's been using a monol. And he's been using a, an oud Najib made. Beautiful sound, a little bit smaller scale. Because this oud, let's measure the scale length of this oud from the nut to the bridge, 610. Now, if you guys remember, I did a restoration on the hat oud for, for Simone, and the length was 620, I think 618, and it's quite long. Even though he liked the sound a lot and the, and the action, it's a little bit too much stretching, so he won't be using oud like that for playing live. And in fact, at this stage in his career, he prefers the smaller mono oud, great sound, and the other oud that uh, Najib made which is a much shorter scale, even shorter than this. So this oud is iconic, it's recorded on Blue Flame, and it's a, it's a tiger, Simone loves it very much. Um, but I think at this stage, the slightly longer scale, the 610 that I just mentioned, it's, it's a bit um, cumbersome. What a sound. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back over them many times until it stabilizes. 
The G is always a nuisance. This is the final step. So I just leave about a quarter of an inch. And after this, you're done. So in the end, it should look like that. And if you leave them long, they'll buzz against the soundboard sometimes, certain frequencies. So that's what you really want. Please stay tuned because we're going to be making a video and we're going to record this instrument alongside of a Nahat and one of my own works. It'll be a fun sound comparison. So stay tuned for that.